gene for her protein and GFP. So wherever her protein went in the cell, then she could follow it. So she wasn't looking at gene expression, she was asking, where in the cell does the protein go? And this was a wonderful new addition because it opened up a lot of new experiments that she did. So she claims I have never paid up on this requirement. I believe I have, but we're still debating that, and it's been 16 years now. In any case, let me tell you why GFP is such an exciting molecule as a marker. So first of all, it is encoded by DNA, so it is inherited by cells. Once you put the DNA into cells or into an organism, the subsequent cells in the organism, whether it's a plant or a bacteria or animal cell, it gets transferred from one generation to the next. So it's not like those preparations we did before. You make the prep once, and then you can look at it. Second, it, looking at GFP doesn't hurt the organism. We're shining blue light on the animal, or on the plant, or on the bacteria. And that shining of blue light doesn't interfere with biological processes, and so we have a chance to watch life unfold. Second, the molecule itself is really small, and this advantage means that it can go to all the parts of the cell. And so it can outline the entire cell, so you can actually see what cells look like. This is particularly important for the nervous system. And, uh, and finally, as I've said a couple times now, it allows one to have a dynamic view of life. One can watch things happen. Particularly as cells change and develop, for example, nerve cells growing out, you can watch that happening. Or, as in the case of where my wife did her studies, she took GFP and she added it to a protein. That's like adding a lantern or a flashlight to the protein and having the protein say, here I am, look at what I'm doing. And so it allows one to watch what's happening over time. <laughs> and so, as I say, it, it acts like a lantern that you can hang on to whatever protein you want or whatever cell. But in fact, as people like John Phillips and uh, uh, Jim Remington have found, the molecule itself looks like a lantern. It's a cylinder, a protein that's a cylinder, and right in the middle there's a single alpha helix, and right in the middle of that is the part that causes, uh, that allows for the fluorescence. So it actually is a biological, molecular lantern that people can add to cells. And the nice thing has been people have used it in lots of different cases. Here's sort of a gallery of many different examples. Uh, here it is in worms, fruit flies. This is a canola plant. These are mice, zebrafish. And this is Alba. Alba the GFP bunny. Alba was commissioned by the Brazilian artist of Royal Park uh, from a French company that made a transgenic bunny, and he wanted it because he wanted to go to various art installations that he was involved in and get people to start talking about the intersection between art and technology and art and science. Alba was a family pet for many years, and uh, Loved, Alba is no more. I have heard a rumor, but I don't know if it's true, that he now has a GFP puppy, but I can't really confirm that. As you can see on the right-hand side of these slides, these are various cells that take, have taken up GFP. And if you look at the bottom here on the right, you see a Purkinje cell from the cerebellum in the brain. And GFP has gone everywhere in the cell, so you see all the fine branching of this cell. Now, as I've said several times, you can see this in living cells. And I want to just remind people about some very simple biology and then show you two movies that I'm very impressed with. I had nothing to do with making the movies. That's why I'm probably particularly impressed. But when a cell divides, the nuclear envelope breaks down so the chromosome can first come to the center and then separate from each other. 
and then the nucleus reforms. So in every cell cycle, the cell division first starts with the nuclear, nuclear envelope breaking down, and then they reform after this division has taken place. Now, during the division, those chromosomes have to move apart from one another, and they do that on what's called the mitotic spindle. Now, the mitotic spindle is primarily made up of microtubules. Now, in the movies I'm going to show you, two different GFP uh, fusion proteins were made. In the first movie, it's to one of the microtubule proteins. So whenever the spindle is made, you'll see GFP will outline the spindle during cell division. The second GFP uh, example I'm going to give is where GFP has been added to what's called a nuclear localization signal. Now what this signal means is that every time there's a nucleus, GFP will go inside of it. But once the nucleus breaks down, GFP will go everywhere in the cell. And I'm going to show you two movies now, both by Rosalind Silverman Gabrilla, who I did these as a graduate student in Canada. And the first one on the left here is, uh, and both of these are of the fruit fly embryo. And in the fruit fly embryo, there are only nuclei, there are no cell boundaries. So we're going to see a bunch of cell divi uh, nuclear divisions very much speeded up in time lapse. And you'll see something about what GFP allows you to look at when we look at these. Uh, let's start this. Okay. You see the spindles forming, separate. The spindles reform at the next round of cell division. And what I hope you can see here in this movie is that all of these nuclei are dividing at the same time. They're synchronous. And this is going to loop through. Now, on the right here is another one of the movies she made. And here you can see color. Now, the color is not different types of fluorescent protein. This is all done with GFP. But she's falsely colored the image so that if there's a lot of GFP, it will appear red. You see a little bit of red here. Then orange, yellow, green, blue. The least is blue and then black for actually nothing. So here you see just a little bit of GFP here, where there's obviously much more GFP in these cells. So the color implies the amount of material. So let me start this movie. Now GFP is everywhere in the cell. Now the nuclei are going to form. And as those nuclei form, the GFP, nuclear localization complex, goes into the nuclei. The nuclei then fall apart as they're going to divide. GFP is everywhere in the embryo, and then it reforms again. Now, in distinction to what is shown over on the left, the example on the right is not synchronous. It's going as a wave across here. So there's something different going on. And you can't really see this unless you are looking at living tissue and living organisms. Now, in my lab, we've used GFP in a lot of different ways. We've used it, as shown here, to uh, look at where genes are expressed. This is a gene only expressed in those six touch sensing cells. It's now known to be an important protein that is needed for the acetylation of microtubules, but it's only in these cells. We've also made protein fusions to look where the protein goes. And here's an example of a protein that's positioned in a dot-like pattern. But once you've labeled the cells, once you can see what's happening, you can then start asking many more questions. Among these questions, we'd ask, what happens? Can we find mutants that have defective development? And here's an example of a cell but instead of having, well, actually, here's a better example, having a single process, this is actually two cells, each is one process. This is one cell with one process here and another process here. And in fact, it splits again here. So this is a cell, a nerve cell, that is growing inappropriately. And we've now found the mutant that 
is effective in this growth. So we can start asking about that. We've also asked about, we've looked for and found mutants that have the wrong number of cells or the cells in the wrong position. And all of these allow us to investigate the development of the animal. And we, the only reason we have these mutants is because we were able to look at the cells in living animals and see differences from the wild type animals. Now, we've also used it as shown on the right hand side, because these are the only cells that are labeled in the animal, we can use this wonderful machine called the fluorescence activated cell sorter. What you do is you take the embryos and you mince them up so that they're individual cells and you put them through this machine and shine a laser. Each drop has a cell. You shine a laser on it. If it's fluorescent, you'll see the color. If it's not, you won't. And then the cell, the cell sorter will direct the cells into one test tube or another, depending on whether they're fluorescent or not. So you can isolate the cells from one another and then study their RNAs or proteins. And this is, these are the isolated cells that we have gotten from the animal, again, because we could label the living cells. Now, as nice as all these procedures are, they clearly needed other things to help them along the way. There had to be improvements of GFP. And one of the people that did a remarkable job in improving GFP, making it much more useful, first, by making it more strongly fluorescent, by mutating it, and then, uh, by make, and also by making different colored fluorescent proteins, because biologists are a greedy bunch of people. If they have one color, they want to have other colors. And that person was Roger Chen, who was the third person to share the prize with us. And here are some of the examples of the fluorescent proteins that his lab generated. Now, he needed to have names for these, and he didn't like the idea that they would be called RFP and YFP and GFP and you know, all a bunch of letters, thought that would be too hard for people to know. So he actually called these after fruits. So this is M cherry, that's M orange. Um, I think this is banana. Uh, this is blueberry. Um, I think this is lime. And I'm not sure what that is. I forget the, the fruit that that was named. That might be melon, I think is, uh, is, is what he calls it. But having multiple colors means that we can look at many more things at the same time. And this has been taken uh, to an extreme in an absolutely wonderful experiment by Jeff Lipman and Josh Sames at Harvard, who decided to use four of the colors in various combinations to multiply label the cells in the brain to label them with so many different colors. It was all the colors of the rainbow. And because it was the rainbow in the brain, of course, they called it rainbow. These are some of their pictures, which are really quite impressive. And we can see how the nerve cells all are coursing through the brain and follow them from one part of the brain to the next. And they're actively working on these now. Now, one of the things that sometimes people ask about GFP to me is, you know, is it, you know, could it be dangerous? Is there a problem with GFP? And I think that really underlies the thing of, of, of people sort of distrusting science because somehow they've gotten the idea that science is always dangerous. I mean, that makes for more exciting science fiction stories and movies, but in reality, what we do with our science depends on our point of view and what we want to do. So I want to give one example of where GFP has been used in a rather remarkable way. Now, this hasn't completely worked out, been worked out, but it's the start, and what I like about it is the idea.